I'm speaking on the life that is truly life. The life that is truly life. Not just life. No, we don't, not just life. The life that is truly life. So are you saying that Daniel, am I living in a sub-life? Am I living in a fantasy? Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? You have to be careful when you say that because people can get that wrong. Like this guy here. Is this real life? Or is this just fantasy? <laughs> oh, dear. Where do those things come from? People... <laughs> People have too much time on their hands. They need to come to church and get saved. They do. Well, afterlife awareness. Have you become so preoccupied with this life that you have become aloof? I love that word, aloof to the reality of the afterlife. There is another life that's coming after this one. And this life is going to go like that. And before you know it, you are into the real life. Are you aware that your actions in this life directly impact what you will be doing in the life to come? Everything you do in this life impacts the life to come. I want you to open your Bibles Go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. In verse 11, Jesus says, uh, says, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. They had this expectation that it was going to happen. Jesus is here. He's the Messiah. It's going to happen, right? That's what that, that was what their expectation was. You know, it's funny because even after Jesus rose from the dead, the, the disciples still had that expectation. That's why the disciples said to him, said, Lord, are you at this time? Now that you've... You've died and you've rose again. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it going to happen now? And Jesus was like, well, no. <laughs> it's not for me to decide the times and dates. This is for my father to decide. So they thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and, and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 Miners, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained from it. And the first one came and said, Sir, your miner has, end, has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, the master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Don't you think that's a big jump in responsibility? That is a massive jump in responsibility. He was faithful in a very small matter, and all of a sudden, he's like the governor of five cities, of ten cities. Goodness me, that's huge. The second came and said, Sir, your miner has earned five more. And his master answered, You take charge of five cities. All of a sudden, he's the mayor of five cities. Wow. Then another servant came and said, Here, sir, here is your miner. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap 
what you did not sow? His master replied, Really? I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit? So that when I come back, I could have collected it with interest. Then he said to those standing by, Take his minor away from him and give it to the one who has ten minors. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. That's in Luke 19, 11 to 26. The time will come one day when you will depart this life and enter into the next. It's coming. Every morning when you wake up is another day that you are closer to eternity and that you are closer to your eternal home. If you believed in Christ and lived your life for him, you'll go to heaven. Now listen to this. And this is going to challenge our, um, our uh, well, sacred, sacred cows. And you know what they say about sacred cows. Today's sacred cows is tomorrow's hamburger. But it says, you will go to heaven for a period of rest. What do I mean by that? It says in Daniel 12, 13, as, you, as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. You will, what? Rest. And then at the end of the days, you will rise to, to receive your allotted inheritance. Hang on a minute. Are you saying we don't go to heaven for eternity? Well, yes, yes, and no. But here's the thing. The time's going to come when the white horse is going to be saddled. Jesus is going to get on that white horse. He's going to depart heaven with his entourage, which is all the people who have gone before us, and they will come back to earth, and Jesus is going to reign on the earth for a thousand years, and we are going to be with him. But guess what happens? At the end of the thousand years... The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, and heaven and earth become one. Right? Yes, so in a way, we will be in the he heaven for eternity. Because at the end of the thousand years, we will, heaven and earth will become one. Spoiler alert. <laughs> so we're training for reigning. There will come a time at the end of the age when you will be resurrected from your grave and you will reign with Christ for a thousand years. What does Paul, the apostle say? The dead in Christ will be raised first and then we who are still alive will be caught up and meet up with him in, in the air. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 says, If we endure, we will also reign with him. Reigning requires a bit of endurance. How many of you are enduring right now? Right? Life is something that you need to endure. Remember what I said um, uh, a few weeks ago. You know, the early church divided the church into two halves. There was the church triumphant and the church militant. The church triumphant is already up there in heaven. They're, they are the, 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 uh, the cloud of witnesses up there cheering us on. That is the church triumphant. But we are the church militant because we are still laboring and struggling and, and uh, contending for the faith. Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Hmm. You thought that parable of ten minors was just a parable. Guess what? You really are going to be given authority over the nations, over people. You really are. Perhaps you will take charge over 10 cities, maybe five cities. I kind of shudder at that responsibility. <laughs> but I know I'll have my new body and hopefully I'm going to be wired in such a way that I'm going to be an administrator. Miracles can happen. 
Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. We're going to be reigning on the earth. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 says, They came to life, that's us, and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. How many can you say, bring it on? Bring it on. However, the extent of the responsibilities you will be given charge of will be completely determined based on your faithfulness to what God has called you to do in this life, in this lifetime. Luke's, uh, Jesus said in Luke 16, verses 10 to 12, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Did you see that? True, true riches. The riches that you have now are not true riches. And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property... Who will give you property of your very own? So are you saying that you, I'm going to have my own house, like a, a, an eternal home? Yes, Jesus said that. He said that. You're going to have your own place. So can you be trusted with real and true possessions? Jesus alludes that the life that is to come is where your real life begins. In the next life is where you have real riches. In the next life is where you will have your very own property. And it's tragic when you look at our world at the moment and the amount of people who are chasing after wealth, chasing after money. Remember what Jesus said, you can serve either one of two masters, God or money. And if you don't have God in your life, guess what you're most probably chasing after? Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Listen, we've heard this thousands of times, but I want you to get a fresh take on this. Where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break and steal. You know, in the investment world, you have a thing called ROI. Some of you know what that is. Return on investment. Return on investment. If people knew of the outstanding ROI on wealth accumulated in the kingdom of heaven, they would quit focusing on all the worldly stuff. They wouldn't be so pedantic with what's going on in the NASDAQ or what's going on with Dow Jones. I don't know who the Jones family are, but I think plenty of people are trying to keep up with them. So, 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, which richly provides us with, with everything for our enjoyment. Aren't you glad that, that's a, that God loves to do that with us? I just love that. God wants you to enjoy life. And, he, you know, and I love that saying, if you can keep money out of your heart, he'll make sure that the money is in your back pocket. He'll look after you. He's a good God. Command them to do good. Be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. And listen to this. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. There is a coming age. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly 
life. Let's take hold of the life that is truly life. When Paul speaks of the life that's truly life, he means it about it in more ways than one. Not only is is it the true life in that we will spend our, our, um, our real life in eternity, but the life on the other side is far more real than this life. And I'm going to show you two short video clips of two men, and these are men who died temporarily and experienced life in the presence of God. And what they have to say is astounding. Now, I need to put a qualifier on this. These testimonies are what you call NDEs or near-death experiences, and you need to be careful, right? Because there's lots out there, and you need to be discerning. Very discerning. You need to line up with what they say with what the Word of God says. That's very, very important. Very important. So what these people, um, these two men are, uh, 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 have ministries of their own. God has blessed them with ministries, and what they have to say is, is just incredible. Let's go to the first man. The first man is called Howard Storm. Here's what he had to say. Um, I was looking at my body. People um, were calling me outside the room, and I went to them, and they said that I had to go with them, and the room was security because my uh, wife was there, and my body was there, and my roommate was there. I was thinking, I kept saying to myself, this is crazy, I don't believe in this, it can't be happening. This I doesn't gotcha. happen, this can't be real, except that I knew that it was the realest thing I was experiencing. It's actually, it's hyper-reality. That's, I know it's hard to explain, but yeah. it was more real than this is real. And they were saying, come with us, hurry up, we know you. And they took me on a very long journey into an ever-increasing closeness and darkness. And the next guy, his name is Mickey Robinson. Sorry, the first guy, he started out with experiencing hell. But then he was taken to heaven and experienced the presence of God. This next man is a man called Mickey Robinson, and he has, also has an extraordinary testimony. He actually was in a plane, and he was going to skydive, but the plane had engine troubles and ended up crashing. And he was severely injured. He had over 50% burns on his body. Here's what he had to say. I mean, I was, I was transferred immediately into a spiritual dimension. Mm -hmm. And everything about the spirit world, is more real than this world. Mm -hmm. The colors are mm -hmm. brighter, the edges of everything are sharper, the emotions are, are just Hiding. enhanced, they are clear. And instantaneously, the thing that, that really struck me the most was there was a complete absence of the awareness of time. Everything in this world is relative to time. You know, you mm -hmm. got up this morning, you'll go to bed at night, something is old, uh, something is new, it will get, get old, something is born, it will die. Everything and this plane, in the physical plane, in the natural plane, is relative mm -hmm. to time. But everything in the spiritual plane is relative to eternity. So what had been natural to be aware of time right. was totally gone. And I was totally aware of eternity. It is shocking. It is stunning to be, to be conscious and to know what eternity is. Also, logic and reasoning doesn't happen there. You know, based on the sum total of all my intelligent thoughts that I've learned, you know, I'm, I had a death and I'm in the spirit world. Fascinating, isn't it? What, what was interesting of the common theme that both those men mentioned was the fact that it was hyper-reality. It was, it was realism. It makes this life that we're living in now like a dream, if I could put it that way. It's like this life is like a dream, and then you wake up, and then all of a sudden you're in reality. That is the life that is truly life. Paul also recounts... Uh, Paul the Apostle spoke of a man who temporarily experienced the afterlife. I'm not sure if you realize this, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2, Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Now, back then, the third heaven, that they, their understanding was three heavens. The sky is the first heaven. The, um, the universe that you can see with the stars is the second heaven. But God's domain was the third heaven. So he's talking about what we understand as heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. Isn't that amazing? 
Remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. This very day, you will be with me in paradise. And heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. So I think it's fascinating because it builds our faith in that way. And again, this is what I would say is um, uh, revelation that you need to be very discerning with. Okay, so this life is compared to a dark piece of glass. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly. Other translations have mirror, right? But then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Paul is liking it to it like seeing through a dark piece of glass. Paul is saying like through a, other translations have like the, um, some say like a broken mirror or a misty mirror. You can't really see, you can kind of make it out, right? But that's what he is saying this life is like. The next life is going to be unbelievably real. As you heard from Mickey Robinson, he said that there are colors that he had never even seen before. Doesn't that get you excited? Incredible. Tastes that you've never tasted before. Smells that you've never smelled before. And the smells will be all good. (laughs) Praise God. Now, there was a girl who received breakthrough surgery that uh, that was to give her sight for the very, very first time. And the mother would constantly be saying to her daughter and trying to describe to her what, the world is like. And the daughter would be saying, Mummy, can you tell me what trees are like again? And she said, well, it's hard to explain it because they're kind of like, they're tall and they're green. And she says, well, she's like, well, what's green? And, and the mother's getting frustrated trying to explain it all. And she said, and the mother would say to her daughter, all I can say to you, my child, is that it's absolutely beautiful. And the time came and she had the operation and they began to take the bandages off her head and they took the patches off her eyes. She opened her eyes with amazement. And the first thing she did, she got out of her bed and she ran to the hospital window and looked outside and she turned to her mother with tears streaming down her face. She said, Mom, Mother, why didn't you tell me it was so beautiful? And the mother just said to him, my child, I tried to tell you. I tried to tell you. But that's what it's going to be like. It's going to be absolutely outstanding. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne. This is going to be on the earth. This is when he's going to be reigning from Jerusalem. It says, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. Now, hang on a minute. He's talking to his disciples. This is important. Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Hang on a minute. Are you saying that the, that the disciples are going to be like governors over each of the 12 tribes of Israel? Yes. There is a bit of a hierarchy in leadership when it comes into the millennial kingdom. All right? So it says, and everyone who has left houses, brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Did you catch that? Sacrifices made in this life will be rewarded and Restored and added with interest. (laughs) Whatever you have sacrificed in this life, you are going to get it. You're going to be blessed with it like a hundred times what you have given up on on this earth. That is so important to understand. Whatever you have sacrificed, whatever you have given up, you're going to get it pressed down, shaken together and 
running over in the afterlife, in the life that is truly life. Hallelujah. Jesus says, but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. And when Jesus returns, he will recompensate. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 10, see, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense. Everybody say recompense. His recompense accompanies him. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 11 says, The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to daughter Zion, see your Savior comes. See his reward is with him and his recompense. There's that word again, accompanies him. Recompense is where you get the word recompensation. Recompensation. He has the ability to do this. In Matthew 16, verse 27, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. In Revelation 22, verse 12, The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Look. I actually prefer behold. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. Wow. Do you feel a sense of responsibility for your life? That's why Paul says, Find out what the will of God is for your life. And once you find out what it is, do it. Be faithful. Be skilled at it. Excel at it. Be like those people who put the miners, who, who get more miners and get more responsibility and more, and more uh, influence in, in the kingdom to come. This life is the testing ground. I prefer the term dress rehearsal to determine what we end up doing in the life to come. It's about being trustworthy with the things he has entrusted to you and faithful to the call that God has placed upon your life. You have to deal with whatever cards have been dealt to you. Some people have been dealt some difficult cards in life. Very difficult. There's the, here are some examples. There's the Christian woman who has longed and prayed for a husband, but finds herself still single in her 40s. There's the Christian couple who yearned earnestly for a baby, and when the time came for the woman to give birth, she labored for 18 hours only to give birth to a stillborn. There's the Christian man who, while playing on a trampoline with his kids, did a somersault and landed the wrong way, and he became a quadriplegic. There's a man who went away on holidays with the family, with the family, and as they were traveling back home, he fell asleep at the wheel and he lost two of his kids. Now these are heartbreaking, devastating. But here's the thing: all those examples are based on true stories. How did they get through that? How did they manage? How did they cope? And here's a screenshot from a tweet in regard to the Buffalo shooting. It says, why would God give strength now? If God wanted to help, he could have stopped the shooting. It's almost like there is no God at all. And you probably... In regard to uh, the shooting that happened just recently in Texas, all these I screenshotted from Twitter, right? My God, my God, no, really, where is God allowing this nonsense? Where is God in times like this, huh? Someone better answer me because God is not. Where is God? Where did he go? We suffer, yet we call on him. Yet he ignores our sufferings. I heard that. This, the tentacle of evil reached deep. I'm so sorry for the kids. What a horrific memory for those kids 
to have instilled their life. Where is God? Where is God in all of this and allowing the senseless violence? Good question. Where is God when the massacres happen? This guy says, God is everywhere except Ulvade, Buffalo, New York, Subway, Goshen, Milwaukee, Clarkson, Lafayette, and so on and on and on. So where is God, this man says? Nowhere is his conclusion. The reality is God was there. Here's the problem. When we push God out of our lives, when we reject God, we are rejecting his hand of protection. We are rejecting his peace. Do you know that they took the prayer out of schools? The Supreme Court passed down a, a, a ruling in which prohibited prayer in schools. The reason why they're saying, God, where is, where is God? Well, they kick God out of the schools. And they're kicking God out of their nation. And when a people kick God out of their nation, it only follows that chaos ensues. Additionally, God does not interfere with evil deeds and tragic events because he has given man the free will. Everybody say free will. Free will. To choose between good and evil. God did not interfere with Cain's decision to kill Abel. God could have stopped it. But in doing so, he would have taken away Cain's free will. Having free will is part of the fact that we are created in God's image. Being made in God's image means that you have free will. And God gave us the choice. Having free will means you've got the choice to choose between good and evil. Deuteronomy 30 says, This day I'll call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. God could have made us like robots that automatically worship him. But no, he wanted us to have free will with the ability and freedom to decide to either choose or reject him. And this life is the life which determines that for the rest of eternity. And understanding this is the key for understanding the purpose of this life. The entire purpose of this life is that God is looking for a people for himself, a people for his very own. God sets the terms by which men come to him, and that is through faith. You know, I get atheists debating with atheists and, just, and talking with atheists, and they say, you know, well, science has looked and they can't find God. No, 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 no. You don't discover God by your terms. God is the one who sets the terms by which he reveals himself, right? And that's through faith. That's through faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. God is looking for a people that despite all their difficulties, despite all their temptations, despite all the efforts of the forces of hell, out of their free will, they still choose to follow God. Think about that. And everything that you've gone through in life. Think about all your hard times. Think about all the times when the devil has tried to oh, do this and you've gone and you've done it. And then the devil rubbed your face in it. Despite all the mistakes that you've made. You got yourself back up and you said, God, I still choose you. I still want to follow you. Remember when Jesus gave the allegorical 
uh, told that allegory. You know, he said that if my uh, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have no part of me. And most of the people got up and walked out and was like, gross. <laughs> Ew. They walked out. He turned to his disciples, are you going to walk out too? What did Peter say? Lord, where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You alone have the words of eternal life. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 13, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. In Revelations chapters 2 and 3, Jesus says, to him who overcomes a total of seven times. Something about that number. And each time follows with a different reward to Christians who overcome in this life. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good. Everybody say good. Of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. He doesn't work in some things. He works in all things. There are no circumstances that are exempt. Every single circumstance whether it's good or bad, God works those things for the good of you because you are called according to his purpose. Billy Graham said, God can take anything that happens to us, even bad things, and use it to shape us and make us into a better, more Christ-like person if we let him. If we let him. Hallelujah. J.C. Ryle, one of my favorite theologians, he said, health is a good thing, but sickness is far better. Hang on a minute. Did he just say that? Yes, he did. Listen. Sickness is far better if it leads us to God. You know that Paul said in Galatians, he says it he says, do you, do you not realize it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you? That's in Galatians. Paul said that. Prosperity is a great mercy, but adversity is a greater one if it brings us to Christ. Anything, anything is better than living in indifference and dying in sin. How many have heard of Johann Sebastian Bach? Did you know that this man lost his little daughter and then later his three sons and then his wife? Talk about tragedy. Then he remarried and then he and his second wife, Anna Magdalena, lost four more daughters and three sons. Eleven beloved children. This is what he went through. Many people wondered back then, how did Bach manage to endure through these tragedies? How did he stop, not stop breathing? How did his heart not stop? And most importantly, how could he continue to write music? Cant cantati, the cello suits, the message, the concerts, the most beautiful music in the world has heard. Do you know how he did it? At the end of the game, he always wrote, Soli Dio Gloria, glory to God alone. And in the beginning, Lord, help. Lord, help. Therefore, you can pray during Bach's music because the music itself is a prayer. Bach's music is a conversation between man and God. I'm going to talk about Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford knew something about life's unexpected challenges. He was a, a successful attorney and real estate investor who lost a fortune in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Around the same time, his beloved four year old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship 
to England, planning to join them after he finished some pressing business at, at the home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and sunk. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's precious daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy. And upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to her husband that began, Saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio immediately set sail for England, and at one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the spot, the very spot where the shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and mind. And he wrote them down, and they have since become a well-beloved hymn. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know. It is well, it is well with my soul. Can I have everybody stand, please? I'm going to put on a song. In fact, it's this song. And as you, we sing this song, I want you to think, Think of the context of it. And think of, of enduring in this life. That this life will soon be gone. It'll, and we'll be in the life that is truly life. Let's sing this marvelous song. When peace like a river a
Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Perhaps we cannot always say that, that everything is well in all aspects of our lives. And there will always be storms to face. And sometimes there will be tragedies. But with faith in a loving God and with trust in his divine help, we can confidently say, it is well with my soul. Let us be reminded that this life is just a dress rehearsal of the life to come. Every single one of us have been given different degrees of difficulty. Every single one of us has been dealt different cards. And we have been entrusted to be faithful with the cards that have been dealt with us. This life is like looking through a glass darkly. But then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. And help us to focus on laying up treasure for ourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Not in this age. No, but in the coming age. So that we may take hold of the life. That is truly life. You ready to pray? Father, bless these people. Encourage these people. Speak to these people. Remind these people that you love them. That they can sense your embrace around them. Lord, encourage them for the road ahead. Encourage them, Lord God, to give them endurance that we may run our race well. So, Father, be with them as they go out into their life and into their, into their world. And, Lord, may your light shine out of them into the dark places where they go. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Bless you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you out there. Let's have some fellowship and let's encourage one another. God bless.